All right, Sarah, are you going to do the introduction? <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Jones. I am the president of Walls Watershed Coalition, Inc. Today for our webinar, we have Ms. Heather Braswell. She is one of our early board members. She is also an active water quality testing member. She is the winner of the Amer American Tree Farmer Systems 2023 Tree Farmer of the Year. She also owns Gaskins Forest Education Center where she hosts the Day in the Woods. It's a day of fun and education for kids. They come around, we set up booths and teach them about the watershed and other various things. Uh, feel free to ask short questions during the presentation, but if you have anything that would be extended answer, please raise your hand at the bottom of the screen in the reactions section. You'll see where it says to raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. She'll speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then we will have a and a at the end. So Heather, over to you. Okay, here comes the share. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I was asked to talk about the impact of forest management on water quality. Um, as Sarah said, um, I uh, do quite a bit as a um, private landowner in uh, forestry. I'm concerned about water quality. I started a bit, a bit of background. I started off as a forest ecologist in North Queensland and Tasmania in Australia. Then I taught uh, science at Coffey High School, and then I taught teachers at Valdosta State University. After I um, uh, I was about to say graduated. After I retired, I took over as uh, managing our forested property and um, have done work in um, increasingly in environmental education. And as Sarah said, I am um, one of the team of water testers for walls. So I really uh, love wetlands. Uh, they're a place where people of all ages can go and enjoy both the woods and the water. And education and outreach is, is important. Um, you can see here that I've got Cub Scouts fishing in the top right, kids dabbling in the Alapaha River in the middle, um, college students from VSU in the river looking for fish, and on the left, ABAC students are looking for reptiles and amphibians. These are some of the kinds of activities on um, my property. The other big thing that I do, and I really invite any of you to join us, is that um, every year I do, uh, I organize um, a day in the woods community event and I invite you to join us on Saturday, April the 12th uh, for that event. It's um, over 40 uh, hands-on interactive activities and demonstrations. Uh, Walls on the right um, has been with us from the very beginning. On the left is another lovely water-related activity called Porter Pond, uh, filled with all kinds of macro invertebrates that you can fish out and try to identify. As uh, Sarah said, I'm one of the water testers and Gretchen uh, did both my initial training and my refresher training uh, in which uh, the photo on the left and I test water at two sites. The one on the right is the um, Alapaha River where Highway 82 uh, bridge crosses over the river. Uh, that's called Shabagi. And um, the water there varies from the brown tannic color to um, a muddy color after we've had heavy rains. The photo on the bottom is right after Hurricane Helene, and you can see there's extensive damage to the vegetation. My second site is a little bit more interesting. 
And this is um, the a little stream that is the outflow from the Alapaha treatment water treatment plant. And um, just for interest, I'm going to take you through the photographs I take. Um, I do monthly testing, and um, you can see the changes in the vegetation around the little creek. So starting in midsummer, look for the seasonal changes. In 2023, you can see the vegetation is starting to die off by September, and it uh, gets more sparse as uh, winter comes on. And then once you start getting into spring, the cattails and the grasses and vegetation start coming back. You can see the uh, water level gets higher because the cattails are all bent over uh, because of the current from uh, the, the stream. But most of the time is just a, a sleepy little uh, creek like that. Uh, get into summer this year, you can see the vegetation has really come back. It's hard to even see the water. Uh, now, you know what happened at the end of September? We had Hurricane Helene, and that's the site after Hurricane Helene. You can see uh, the erosion and the kinds of problems uh, that um, uh, concern us as, um, with water quality. Okay, so now I want to start talking about uh, how private forest landowners um, deal with both the forest management and taking care of our water quality. I'm particularly talking about private landowners in uh, the coastal plain area and who often have planted pines uh, as a big part of their forest management. Typically, those landowners have multiple objectives, and I'm not going to uh, go into the detail here, but we obviously need to get some income from harvesting, and that can be timber or it can be pine straw, and there are other products that you can harvest as well. But not only are we concerned with income, we're also uh, very often concerned with um, conserving and maintaining and uh, improving habitat for wildlife. This uh, involves um, management uh, practices like using prescribed fire and uh, controlling invasive uh, plants on the property. Um, neither of those things will bring you in any more income uh, and they're a cost out of your pocket. One of the things that, to me, that's really interesting, a lot of landowners uh, want to maintain opportunities for recreation, which includes hunting and fishing, and um, uh, people don't always understand that hunting and fishing are an important source of funding for conservation. When you buy equipment related to hunting, fishing, camping, hiking, birding, all those different things, um, a specific uh, proportion of the taxes is directly earmarked uh, for funding purchase of conservation areas, hunter education, and um, things like that. Um, and often your landowners are also interested in, in uh, supporting environmental education and outreach, which increases um, public understanding of what we do in forestry. Now, we all know, because uh, we're in walls, that Georgia has um, a rich uh, abundance of streams and wetlands, and these are critical not just for recreation, and uh, providing clean water, but they're also important for your wildlife and conservation purposes. These are so important that um, they're um, a, a critical component of the state wildlife action plans. Um, these action plans uh, uh, started in 2005 as a requirement to receive federal funding for conservation. Um, they, it was renewed in 2015, and the next update is uh, scheduled for release in early 2025. 
And the way it works is that they uh, are looking for um, conservation opportunity areas, trying to prioritize what is most important in terms of both acquisition and protection using um, things like easements and so on. And you can see on the left, the yellow areas, and on the right, the orange areas. These are areas that are already under conservation protection. Um, they're sometimes referred to as the conservation hubs. And then what we try to do is to connect these hubs uh, with corridors in between. So this kind of hubs and corridors is uh, described uh, with the term greenways. You can see the improvement and the development from 2005 to 2015. Uh, the dark green in the on the right-hand map is uh, in the southeast corner is um, the Altamaha River. And going down from that is a lighter green color. Um, that's the Alapaha River, which is a priority two uh, conservation area. And for um, obvious reasons, these corridors often follow the, the rivers and waterways because they're so wet that you're more likely to have natural ecosystems and for them to serve as um, cover and habitat for wildlife. So we all know that our forests are valuable. Uh, they provide many ecosystem services that benefit the entire population, not just the landowners who are responsible for managing those forests. So I'm going to uh, quickly go down a couple of the key ones that need to concern us now. Obviously, they provide timber and they're essential for maintaining clean water. Uh, they also are important in regulating uh, climate and um, they sequester carbon, um, important in um, climate change um, operations. They are important in the water cycle, the process of infiltration, runoff, um, uptake, evapotranspiration, and so on. Uh, so the clean water depends on that water cycle. The trees are also important for both forming the soil, um, the structure, breaking it down, and also for cycling nutrients through the soil. And one of the ones that concerns us in terms of fishing and swimming is recreation and tourism. And these are going to become increasingly important um, drivers of conservation efforts in our uh, waterways. Not only do we intellectually know that our forests are valuable, we also know that aesthetically they're beautiful. Um, they're, uh, they term uh, forest bathing is a little bit funky, uh, but there's research showing that we benefit both physically and mentally um, from spending time in forested um, and outdoor areas. Uh, things like birding, hiking, uh, hunting, uh, great ways to spend time outdoors and uh, feel good about it. The problem uh, arises with the general public is that what's not often, they want to keep those forests being beautiful, but they don't always appreciate what's um, involved in maintaining those forests. And uh, for private landowners, those forests are actively managed. We need to get harvesting for income. We need to do regular prescribed burning to maintain those fire adapted forests that are so good for your uh, wildlife habitat. We also use herbicides uh, to prepare sites for replanting and also for trying to uh, control the invasive plants. And as a result, um, uh, some of the public think our beautiful forests are being destroyed or at minimum, uh, they're being uglified. Uh, turned ugly. So I work a lot with native plant people and a number of times people have said, I shouldn't cut trees, I shouldn't burn, I shouldn't use herbicides. 
But the reality is that these effects are temporary. It doesn't take very long for your forest to recover and look beautiful once again. The photo on the left is an area that uh, was clear cut and it was herbicided twice and replanted uh, with pine seedlings. And six months after that, you can see just how beautiful that ground cover and understory is. Wonderful habitat for your um, all your wildlife. The photo on the right has been thinned and burned every two to three years. And again, just um, the uh, this is just six months after burning. It's amazing how quickly uh, the undergrowth, the ground cover recovers. Our vegetation is adapted for fires and they require fires to stay in that open herbaceous uh, ground cover uh, condition. Now, we all, so, uh, we all know that um, we're trying to do a good job with our forests, uh, but it doesn't always work out as well as we hope. We sometimes miss the target. But I hope that we can all um, agree that not all forestry practices are as good as we want and they're not as bad as some, th uh, some folks uh, think. So they're not all good and not all bad. So let's um, look at what um, in forestry we use as the target. So in 1981, the feds mandated the states to come up with a way to define best management practices that will protect the nation's waters so that we can ensure that they are fishable and swimmable for generations to come. Now, these um, best management practices have been defined as uh, their common sense methods and practices that are um, used to prevent and reduce uh, water pollution during forestry operations. The uh, compliance has been monitored and for over 20 years, the compliance with those best management practices has been over 90%. Um, you know, people drive by and see uh, the forest operations and they say how dreadful it is, but we have over 90% compliance. And for most of the practices, the compliance is about 95 to 97%. Uh, the, uh, I think the only one that's lower than that is um, the uh, roads and stream crossings, which are very difficult uh, to, to stay on target. So let's look at some of the details of uh, particularly practices that impact water quality. One of the most important is uh, the, that um, foresters need to maintain a streamside management zone. These are buffer strips adjacent to the streams and wetlands, and they uh, protect water quality by preventing erosion. The roots hold the soil together and they absorb and filter pollutants so that they don't get into the, into the wetlands. Uh, they also... Uh, slow down the flow of water and uh, prevent the, uh, do some flood protection. The shade from the trees and vegetation keeps the waters cooler and that help, uh, helps um, um, some of your fish and aquatic animals, uh, particularly in the north, uh, the trout streams, uh, shading is very important. Um, the woody debris that's maintained in the creeks is important habitat for your aquatic animals. Um, and of course, that provides uh, travel corridors for your animals as well. So here's what it looks like in the uh, BMP manual in the bottom left. In the coastal plain, we don't have very steep uh, slopes. So we're in the slight slope class. And you can see for perennial streams that flow all year, um, you need to leave 40 uh, feet of 
uh, vegetation on each side of the creek. That's 80 feet total. If the streams dry up now and then, um, the intermittent streams need uh, less buffer, um, only 20 feet on each side. And I leave it to you whether you think that um, photo on the right has at least 40 feet of um, vegetation in the streamside management zone. I don't think so. Here's what it looks like uh, from the air, and you can see how easy it would be to monitor uh, the streams and the uh, width of the streamside uh, management zones that have been retained after those areas were clear cut. On the left, you can see an area that was clear cut um, a, a little over a year ago, maybe two years now, and they didn't leave a streamside management zone uh, when they converted it to agriculture, and they certainly should have because there is a real erosion problem uh, there. One of the other main uh, things for us to think about are the protections for roads and stream crossings. And here's the specifications um, for um, on the table on the left shows you how far apart do you need to, how, or how close together, do you need to do dips and turnouts uh, when you're on a sloping um, area. And the diagram shows you how those dips and turnouts should be constructed to get the water off the road and not running down uh, the, the, the trails. The uh, same thing with the stream crossings. Um, a lot of landowners underestimate how big culverts need to be going under um, woods trails and they, they come a big storm or a hurricane and these uh, culverts blow out and uh, create a lot of erosion and damage. You can see um, that uh, they, um, uh, if you have only 10 acres of drainage at catchment area, your pipe in the lower coastal plain needs to be 24 inches in diameter or 15 inches in the upper coastal plain. And those culverts cost an arm and a leg. It's um, a, not a trivial thing to do. Expense is a major consideration for your private landowners. If you look at the uh, top left-hand uh, photo, that all they did is bring in some rocks for that uh, ford so that um, when the water uh, level comes up and flows over um, the trail, uh, you don't get erosion, but the tr trucks and vehicles don't get bogged either. That cost over $1,000 just to get that much done. A really nice system is the EnviroGrid in the top right-hand corner, and it has expandable uh, plastic um, web that you fill with uh, gravel. And that web just by itself costs a dollar a square foot. So if you have a small crossing 20 feet by 50 feet, you've already spent $1,000 uh, just in the EnviroGrid, let alone the cost of installing it and filling it with gravel. So that's expensive. Uh, bottom left is my water testing site number two. Um, because of even before Hurricane Helene, I um, had seen that there was increasing erosion problems with some gullying in the last two years. I called in an NRCS um, engineer and uh, got um, advice on what would be needed to fix it. And he quoted $100,000 and more simply to fix it in the width of the power line right of way, let alone the gullying upstream and downstream. And that, of course, is um, really out of range for a private landowner. Um, I don't know what on earth I can do with that. While we're talking about um, erosion and uh, roads and, and crossings, one of the things that um, some uh, people have used is this erosion mesh on the bottom right. It holds the um, uh, 
uh, slopes, uh, area on slopes together so that the grass can go through it and stabilize the slope, minimizing erosion. The problem is that uh, snakes and small mammals get trapped underneath and the biologists really, really don't like it. Uh, so avoid it if you can. So the BMPs are the basic uh, bedrock of uh, what is expected of all landowners and all forest managers. But you can go beyond that uh, to practice what is um, referred to as sustainable forestry. In the general public, uh, when we talk about sustainable forestry, people often think, oh, that simply means that uh, we, when we clear cut, we replant. In other words, our wood is a rene renewable resource, but sustainable forestry goes far beyond that. It's um, the American Forest Foundation has developed sustainable forestry standards that you can um, get online and they are looking not just at reforesting, but also looking at uh, promoting environmental and social benefits and also increased understanding of uh, good forest practices. So if you look at the logo for the American tree farm system uh, um, on this page, you can see that wood is only one of four of the main objectives uh, that are expected for sustainable forestry. So not only do we have to uh, provide timber, we also need to uh, protect clean water. We need to provide wildlife habitat and opportunities for recreation. And you can see that reflected in uh, the titles of the different standards. So number three, is when you cut, you replant. Number four is we need to protect air, water, and soil. Number five is your wildlife habitat. And number six, aesthetics includes recreation. So this is what we mean by sustainable forestry. And why is it important for us to define that? Because as a private landowner or any uh, person practicing forestry on lands, uh, private or industrial, you can certify your property that to state that you're practicing sustainable forestry practices. And these are the basis for certification. These uh, management practices, you have to have a management plan that you document, and then inspectors come and monitor at regular intervals to make sure that you're uh, continuing to practice those uh, sustainable forestry. So why do we do that? Because uh, we want a system to provide a chain of custody from the source, which is me as a timber grower, to the end user, who is you buying paper and wood and uh, various other products. And if I hope if you haven't already seen this um, logo on the back of envelopes, uh, you'll notice it uh, next, next time as you look through the mail in your mailbox. And you can see that it says certified sourcing um, using the criteria of sustainable forestry initiative. There are two main uh, sourcing um, programs that are used in Georgia uh, for pine trees. There's another one used for mixed hardwood stands. I'm not going to go into that. The Sustainable Forestry Initiative is used on industrial forest land and the American Tree Farm System is used to certify private uh, family forest land. So as a private landowner, why would you want to certify your property? First of all, you um, are, are probably going to be proud that you're practicing forest stewardship and that that is recognized in the industry. Second, you want to, um, I, I like certainly like to support cus discerning customers who want to know that when they buy something, um, they'll buy this product that comes from a certified source compared with another one that does not. 
As you can see from the photo on the right, this was taken after Hurricane Helene, and I have several leaning trees uh, as evidence. And after a situation like that, where there's a lot of uh, damage to your, to your timber stands, uh, there is a glut on the market. Everybody wants to salvage timber before diseases and so on set in. The practical reality is that you're more likely to be able to sell your timber um, as salvage if your uh, property has been certified as a tree farm and your forest consultant or forest manager has um, uh, an inside track uh, to the uh, timber buyers. At this time, the, you don't get a higher price for your wood but there's something coming down the road that's going to change, uh, put a lot of more pressure on us certifying our property. And that is that the EU is, uh, get, has started um, a program that will be implemented by the end of the year, saying they will import only from certified sources. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on um, the sawmills to be able to certify, which is going to put a lot of pressure on the landowners uh, to, be, uh, to get certified for their property. That's not the end of the road. Um, beyond sustainable forestry, there is also what's called ecological forestry. And I've been to one of their uh, wonderful three-day workshops. And this is where your, pre your main goal in uh, managing for forestry is for conservation purposes, not for income. And so this is typical on your federal and state land, your military um, bases and your state parks, wildlife uh, management areas and so on. And I'm not going to go there um, as I talk forward. So let's look at some of these practices and how they impact our water quality and what uh, we can do to minimize those impacts. The main problem is when we do logging. When you get that heavy equipment on the property, you're disturbing the soil and you're compacting it. And that uh, the disturbance increases erosion potential and the compaction um, reduces the infiltration so the water stays on top of the soil instead of penetrating through into the groundwater. And one of the things you can do, the photo on the right, uh, was taken during hurricane salvage operations on my place, and they brought in these wood mats uh, that are used um, in places where you get a lot of uh, traffic to prevent uh, too much compaction and uh, ruts from developing. The other thing that happens during logging is that we're um, building and using roads and stream crossings, and if these are not done properly, they can alter the water flow, uh, debris can clog up the uh, streams, and you can get all kinds of um, changing hydrology on the roads. One of the things you can do in the really wet areas in the bottom right is that you can uh, put some of the um, understory small trees that are not going to be used for harvest and you put them across the wet spots um, so that when the um, heavy equipment goes across the weight is being spread you're not stirring up the mud in the streams and um, so it's protecting the streams and minimizing compaction and any kind of rutting. When they've finished the harvest, they are required to uh, pull all the, that uh, debris out of the stream so the, the water can flow freely again. So that's a temporary um, process. It, it's not a permanent one. Um, one of the things that uh, people outside of the forestry uh, don't always understand is that uh, the importance of forests in terms of doing evapotranspiration. 
the trees will um, suck up water from the soil and transpire and evaporate it so the water vapor goes into the atmosphere. That has a big impact on the water table. So if you cut the trees, the water table can increase. And after you've harvested, you get a lot more water logging, flooding in those uh, cleared sites. And that's what people see and think we should never have been in there first place. But the moment those trees start growing again, uh, they'll start that evapotranspiration and the water table will drop again. Another point that I want to make here is that logging is a long rotation crop. If you use the plantation model uh, that is uh, common in South Georgia. Uh, but if you compare the impacts on soil, clean, uh, soil erosion and clean water for forestry, compare it with agriculture, where you have an annual crop, um, you can see um, that forestry is certainly doesn't have the impacts that um, agriculture does. Another time that people see um, forest operations and they worry about our soil and water is when we're preparing the sites for replanting. In, in the wetter sites, in the left-hand photo, in the bottomlands, we have real problems with because of the water logging. You have low pH, low nutrients. And remember what I said, that, that the water logging and flooding that you see is going to uh, diminish once the trees start growing. The typical site preparation in those uh, places is this um, bedding so that the plants, uh, the uh, pine trees, will survive. And that is not only ugly and um, causes a lot of dis soil disturbance, it also inhibits uh, wildlife movement and has um, some serious um, uh, concerns in those sites. But a lot of the places where we're growing trees are the well-drained sandy loams that are typical of the coastal plain uplands. And um, if you look at the photo on the right, um, after you've um, done the clear cut, particularly if you've been burning and don't have a lot of woody debris, you can go straight in after, typically after herbicide and burning to get rid of as much as you can. Um, the uh, tree planters can go straight in and plant by hand without any more heavy equipment at all. Um, in be, uh, the photo in the middle is that if you've got a little bit more debris, you might want to move the debris aside using uh, a tractor with a V-blade in front of it. And that V-blade is not a bulldozer. It's um, The blade is above the level of the soil and it merely pushes the woody debris to the side so that it's not it's minimally disturbing the soil. And then uh, that can be either hand planted or machine planted. And it has the advantage if you're hand planting that it keeps the rows straight and at the right distance so those hand planters um, don't get too lost. We also do pine straw harvesting. And um, a lot of the people who do the raking drive their vehicles, um, which are lightweight vehicles, not the heavy equipment, onto the site. And that does reduce infiltration um, and removing the ground cover um, uh, can increase erosion potential if the sites are on a slope. And another concern is that by reducing the organic material and the nutrients, uh, you're the organ they're important in maintaining the soil structure that allows aeration and infiltration and also reduces nutrients on the side. But typically your pine straw harvesting is just for a few years and then you reestablish um, an understory under it. The other thing to consider 
is that um, that's an for private landowners that's an important source of income that covers the costs of that burning and herbicide control uh, that you're um, implementing in other places on your property. So, so next one to think about is prescribed burning, and um, the fires do alter the ground cover. They reduce the amount of woody vegetation and increase the amount of herbaceous understory. That changes the root structure in the soils. The woody plants, which includes your trees and your overstory, um, typically when it rains, the roots provide um, a, a conduit for the water to go into the soil and go deep into the groundwater. So it helps infiltration. On the other hand, your grasses and herbaceous vegetation with their uh, fibrous roots, they're incredibly important in soil uh, stabilization and places where you're concerned about reducing uh, pollutants and fertilizers from getting into your ponds and rivers. So they um, reduce erosion and absorb uh, chemicals. The big problem with prescribed burn uh, burning is if you have put, try to put in fire breaks in between your planted pines and your wetland areas, uh, because uh, when the Forestry Commission comes in and makes those fire breaks, they have to get down to the mineral soil, and that often means um, bulldozing through uh, six inches at least of matted roots from your gallberry and, and tie tie, and so you finish up with this deep trench that fills with water, and it creates, um, it's uh, uh, certainly not... Uh, uh, desirable for, from a wildlife uh, point of view. However, um, the more I burn, the more I'm uh, retiring all of those kind of uh, fire breaks, and I wish I had never put them in in the first place. Typically, if you've got uh, wetlands next to your um, upland um, pine plantations, the fire will stop before it goes very far into your wetlands. You do, of course, have to be very uh, careful, particularly if you have neighbors, to make sure it doesn't come out the other side. So the other thing that I've talked about is uh, applying herbicides. And it's important to remember that herbicides kill the plants, but there is no root disturbance. A lot of the mechanical methods like um, hand pulling or um, using a tractor to, to, to pull the plants out disturbs the soil and creates erosion problems, etc. But herbicides can move with both the air and the water. So we have to be very careful about how we use, uh, use them. And Different herbicides have different kinds of properties that we need to understand. Some chemicals are volatile, and we simply shouldn't be using them in summer when the temperatures are hot. Other, so other um, herbicides, uh, some move in the soil, others are trapped um, instantly, they hit the, the soil. They do not move and are not going to cause problems to your groundwater and your uh, streams. And some of them have very short half-lives. They break down, so they're likely to uh, be deactivated um, as they move through the soil before they get into your wet wetlands. But I want to stress that if you're going to use herbicides, you need to know what you're doing. I liken it to painting. You uh, get to choose your colors, your medium, and the tools you use. When you're uh, using herbicides, you need to understand all of that. You need The herbicides, there are different categories that uh, target different kind of plants in different ways. So some herbicides are likely to kill a wide range of plants. Others will be a lot more selective and they may kill conifers but not hardwoods. They may kill broad um, leaf understory but not kill grasses. So you select the, the appropriate herbicide and I've already said 
you need to be careful about if they ones that uh, move in the air and the soil. You can do most of your herbicides um, using chemicals that do not move in the air and the soil. When you apply the herbicides, you can either use broadcast methods, and these are often used when you're preparing sites for replanting, um, but you can also use very targeted methods that uh, where you micromanage your application so that you hit, um, typically used when you're trying to kill invasive plants and not kill your native plants. So the two photos are examples of this. The left-hand photo was where I used a broadcast application and um, for site preparation. And six months later, you can see uh, my herbicides were targeted so that they did not kill grasses. That means I've got a jump start on wildlife habitat and also maintained fuel so that I can bring in uh, prescribed fires as soon as I want. On the right hand photo, I decided I hear so many people saying herbicides kill everything in sight. And so I decided to do a micromanaging with my backpack. And I use glyphosate, which is a broad scale herbicide. And I used my nozzle to be very careful about applying it. And you can see I sprayed my initials into the um, mowed turf at the Ed Center. In all of these management practices, it's important when we're protecting our waters as well as using just best management practices and sustainable forestry, it's important that we understand our soils. And these are two sites you can go to that provide really valuable information on your particular uh, tract of land. So you can see I've got this triangle shaped tract and the one on the left is U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wetland mapper, and it simply divides it into wetlands and um, uh, well-drained soils. And that's really important for um, uh, best management practices. The web soil survey gives you more detail about your soils. And you can, again, mark out the area you're interested in, hit a button, and it shows you how many acres for each type of soil. You can click on the soil name, and it'll come up with a description of the soil characteristics. You can also download the app. And as you um, move over your property, you can click the button and it'll tell you what soil type is uh, there is right under your feet. So that's important information for good management. You should also know your climate when you're planning your forest management. On the left-hand side, I created this climatogram. Blue is rainfall. And you can see that in Alapaha, we have two main dry periods, relatively dry, in the spring, April, May, and in the fall, October, November. And this is when you want to plan for your uh, pond building, road uh, maintenance, and also for logging in your uh, wetland, uh, your bottom lands, uh, so that you're minimizing uh, rutting compaction and all those other problems, uh, potential problems that we've talked about. You can also, um, understanding your climate, you can, if you've got um, bottom land areas uh, next to the river, you, there are some stream gauges you can go to maintained by US Geological Service that um, tell you the stream height, stream volume, etc. And this one is located at my uh, water testing site one. So my last slide, things to consider um, as we think about minimizing un or understanding how forest management practices impact water quality. One is to think about those planted pines. They're not uh, wilderness um, uh, old growth forests. They are long rotation crops and the landowners need to harvest to get income to be able to uh, uh, manage their property. The second thing is that sustainable forestry is a lot more than replanting trees. Forest landowners care about uh, wood, water, wildlife and recreation. 
And landowners have those multiple objectives, but even with the best of intentions, the ex, uh, a lot of the good practices cost you money, but they don't bring you in any more income. And so you have to be careful about um, what uh, practices you can um, implement. The other thing is that we can't control the weather. Everyone wants to do their logging and their road work in, in, when they, in the dry spells. And that means that uh, you, if you put, the smaller the landowner is, the harder it is for you to get people to come in and do the, that work when you want it done. The other element is that if you get a big storm and um, you get a lot of rain, uh, there's a lot of inertia in logging. It costs a lot of money for the loggers to move to a new site and they don't want to shut down because they've got employees who, who have a job to do and they need that um, uh, salary. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that implement, um, that it, um, make it difficult for forest managers to do the best possible job they would like uh, many of us would like to do ecological forestry. We're happy if we can do sustainable forestry and we sure try to do even more than best management practices. So um, that's, um, I hope I didn't go too far over. I'm ready for questions. Looks like we've got a, about five more minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions for Heather? Well, I don't necessarily have a question, but I, I did write in the chat there that the sizing of the culverts or making sure that um, municipalities have uh, bridges that are appropriately sized is a challenge, uh, especially with um, the variability in rainfall. So the city of Valdosta had 15 inches of rain in 48 hours and the drainage in the city was enormous and many culverts and, you know, littler bridges were undermined and the roads are closed still. So not only is that an issue for um, private landowners, but it's also a problem in general. Yes, and particularly when we've been getting uh, rainfall events that are more e intense um, than uh, is um, uh, well above the average for the last 100, 200, whatever years. Um, how do you get someone to actually show up to log? The best thing you can do is to have a forest uh, consultant. Even for small landowners, um, it, uh, when I went through um, my forestry program, uh, one of the things they, they did is show that you can actually save money by having a forestry consultant because they're more likely to get you uh, good prices um, from the sawmills. And so even though you pay them, um, uh, what, what do you call it, the percentage um, for doing the, the work for you, they can connect you for, with all the consultants for planting and herbiciding and um, road building, all of those things. Um, I don't want to have to go trying to handle marketing by myself. So there are a lot of ways that your forest consultant can save you money and a lot of grief and aggravation as well. Uh, they also, as I said, in times of um, stressed markets like after the hurricane, um, they're the ones who are going to have the ear of the loggers who are going to be very busy and overworked and have access to the procurement uh, people for, um, from the sawmills. So they get you in where you couldn't get in otherwise. I guess the follow-up question is, how do you get a forest consultant to pay attention unless you have thousands of acres, especially in current conditions after the hurricane? Well, if you've got a forest consultant before the hurricane, um, that that's what I'm saying is critical. Have them in place and ready to go. Mm. Um there is, uh, you can find, um, it's really good to get a forest consultant who listens to you. 
and mm -hmm. who is concerned about uh, best management practices and conservation and clean water. Uh, my uh, consultant um, for over a decade, um, he came in and I said he said I should clear cut that triangle tract uh, because it wasn't growing very well. And I said, I'm not clear cutting 600 acres. And so he <laughs> came up with a system that was very like uh, the hubs and um, uh, corridors of the uh, uh, state action, wildlife action plan. He said, well, here's all your swamps on that tract and we're going to save uh, um, uh, stands of pine trees that connect them all up to provide wildlife corridors and place mm -hmm. for them to move in between. He also came up with a system for underplanting longleaf underneath uh, mm -hmm. a loblolly stand so that you get a gradual transition and you don't get those ugly effects of clear cut and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things you can interview the um, uh, consultants on when you um, do the selection process. But another one is word of thumb. And the other thing, if you're a small landowner, is to, if you can work in with um, adjacent landowners, um, even um, I've got more, uh, quite a few acres here. And um, even so, there are a lot of uh, economies of scale. If I can combine with my kin folks who've got property in north, south, east, and west, and mm. uh, friends who are even further north, south, east, and west. So when you get a helicopter in, you're more likely to be able to get them. When you get a planter in, you're more likely to get them. So that um, uh, uh, work collaborating with your neighbours is, is a great way to get your consultants and get work done when you want it. And that also helps if, of course, you're using the same forestry consultant as your, your neighbours. Mm -hmm. All good points. Janet, ask a question. Maybe she's asleep. I think she's working. Ah, uh, probably. Sarah, um, ask a I question. would like to be posting this on YouTube. So if you wanted to add a little information about how to join in with a day in the woods. Maybe uh, yes. Email me and I will certainly um, lead up, have, um, um, it'll be featured on my Facebook. I'll, I'll have several posts as I lead up to it. Um, I'm always looking for people who are willing to be presenters with interactive um, activities and demonstrations. And um, John and I um, talked to a guy at a booth opposite us at the Alapaha Station celebration last Saturday. So I've recruited another guy who's going to talk about uh, baits and, and things. Uh, and he has uh, named his firm Shaboggy which apparently comes from uh, the local jargon that she sure is boggy <laughs> in this area. Well, that was the name of the package store right next to the boat ramp. Yes, she boggy. indeed. Mm -hmm. Yep, she boggy baits. Um, so you, you, do you have a contact slide? Could you slap it up? Certainly. Oh, here we go. This one. There it is. Well, that's how to reach you about a day in the woods and any other questions, particularly about the Gaskins Forest Education Center. And I make the um, Education Center available for anybody doing any programs related to environmental education. I don't do all the programs. I I just may, I just host it. And um, a couple of them now and then I help with, um, but I also have events um, that other people organize and I have almost nothing to do with it, except mow the lawns and clean the toilets. We did a high school contest, art contest for a logo for the Alapaha River water trail there. Yes. 
Well, and we had uh, the booth there a couple of times with the Boys and Girls Clubs events that you had this past summer, and those were wonderful. It's yes. Really and one of the things I really liked about that is um, that a lot of the students who came uh, were minority who are um, typically uh, don't have as much um, opportunity whether it's used or not, um, to um, do outdoor activities in natural environments. A lot of your state parks and national parks have far lower numbers, percentages of uh, visitors. And so the more we can get um, the kids of all um, um, ages, <laughs> um, races, whatever, the more we can get them all uh, coming and feeling comfortable in the outdoors, uh, the more we're going to have them valuing uh, conservation and valuing uh, the importance of clean water and um, good forests. All righty. Great point. All right. If there's no more questions, we are... Two minutes past one o'clock, and I'm oh. sure everybody's wanting me to back to work. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>